Okay, so today I'd like to redo the degenerate state perturbation theory because I think it was just an overly complicated derivation that I gave you last time, but I've given you, I've developed something that's much simpler. And then I'm going to go on and discuss L.S. coupling in alkali atoms. So let me start. By assuming that what we have is a Hamiltonian H, which is H0 plus lambda V, and we have G states that are degenerate. We can label them as M, and they have energy, they have all the same energy, ED0. And we can make a projection operator on the subspace, which is, of course, just the sum M equals 1 to G of M0, M0. So this is the projection operator on the space spanned by the degenerate eigenstates of the simple Hamiltonian. And we can make a potential VT, which is the truncated version of the total potential with projection operators on both sides. And we saw when we discussed first order perturbation theory, both degenerate and non-degenerate, that we can find, this is obviously an emission operator. In fact, it's effectively a G by G emission matrix. And so we can find G eigenstates with energies, I'm going to call them delta 1 sub D sub L. That's an overloaded notation, but I didn't see anything really simpler. And these eigenstates, of course, are linear combinations of, in fact, one way of writing them is as PT on L0. So it's a sum M0, M0, L0, and you can find G. So these are the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian that I'm going to call H0D, which is to say H0 plus VD. So these L states are, you can say H0D on L0 is equal to, of course, H0 plus VD on L0. And this is going to be equal to H0D plus delta 1 sub D sub L, L0. And the assumption here, which is critical, is that this truncated potential completely lifts the degeneracy or splits the states. So delta 1 DL is not equal to delta 1 DL prime, but L is not equal to L prime. So the degeneracy is, the energy levels are split, the degeneracy is all gone. So in effect, if we write the Hamiltonian H as H0D plus V, and I'm calling this lambda, whoops, there was a slight mistake here. There's a lambda here plus lambda VD, and this is then a lambda of L. So we can write H as H0D plus lambda VD prime, where VD prime is equal to V minus VD. And I see I've got a bit of a typo here. We need a lambda there. We need a lambda here. I frankly think that this lambda is, you can 
do without lambda and we can just say B is small, which is much better off. Um, okay, so now what we've got then is we've effectively, we, we've, by doing first order perturbation theory, we've removed the degeneracy. So now we have, now we can simply do non degenerate perturbation theory on these G levels. Your L values, G values of L, they all have now have different energies, the energies being um, E0 of D plus lambda delta 1 sub DL, those being the, uh, these eigenvalues of the truncated matrix. So now we can do non-degenerate perturbation theory, which is the stuff that we um, understand in the lambda missing. Well, the trouble is, these are power series of lambda, so that's why we can't really get rid of lambda. So that's the idea. Uh, we're going to do non-degenerate perturbation theory now, and delta L is going to be EL minus uh, EL0. Notice EL0 is this eigenvalue here. E D zero plus lambda plus um, lambda delta one uh, sub D L. And this is going to be then a lambda delta one sub L. This is actually going to turn out to be zero. And then lambda squared delta P L and then uh, so forth. And according to the formulas we developed uh, in the lecture one, not the last time, but the time before that, the perturbation then is V prime D and um, the kth order correction to the energy is going to be the matrix element of the perturbation between the zero order eigenstate and the uh, k minus first order uh, eigenvector. And uh, delta L itself is going to be um, lambda times L zero d prime sub d L, where this is the exact eigenstate. And um, as I said to you at the end of that lecture, the penultimate lecture, um, the one, the one before. The next to the last one. Um, this is EL0 minus H0D. H0D, of course, is, a, a is, is, is um, H0D, where did I write that down? Is H0 plus lambda VD, V sub D. And uh, A sub L is a, is a projection operator. I'm going to write down in a second. Let me just finish this. It's V prime D minus delta L. And all this over the state L zero. So this is an infinite power series in lambda. And what you do is um, you take the lowest order approximation, the order lambda approximation uh, for delta L, that gives you L to order lambda. Then you substitute that in here and you get any energy to order lambda squared. Then you put that in here and then you can get the state to order lambda squared. Then you put that in here and you get the energy to order lambda cubed. Put that back in here and you get the state to order lambda cubed and so forth. So you basically climb a ladder there. This a sub, a sub L is then a sum k not equal to L of k0, k0. So it's the projection operator on all states except uh, L0. So this, this, this is, is, is the identity operator. So it's an identity operator that avoids Boys, 
state calls to it. By the way, you might ask, what happens if degeneracy isn't lifted? Then the situation is that you've got to use other methods. You can't use standard provision here. One way of doing it is to just take the whole Hamiltonian, choose an appropriate set of basis states that you can work with easily, compute all the matrix elements of the whole Hamiltonian, diagonalize it, and so forth. Once you compute the matrix elements, the diagonalization can be done on the computer in microseconds. As long as you're... Does splitting this work more often than not? I'm sorry, does what? When you split it into these levels, in general, does that work more often than not? The problem, if you have a problem that splits it, then you can do what I'm talking about, what I'm showing today. If it does not, then you have to do something else. You have to find these, though, right? You have to find them, like the degeneracies? Well, I mean, the problem that you have tells you what H0 and V and lambda are. And then you see, you look at the eigenstates of H0. If you have a degeneracy, then you form this truncated potential, and you see whether it has any eigenvalues that are degenerate, or equivalently, whether all of its eigenvectors have different eigenvalues. If they do, you can proceed. If they don't, you have to use a different method. Because this will not give the right answer, even if you take... You go to order, infinite order of lambda. It would be wrong. In fact, I'm thinking of signing a homework problem on that. But it would be, of course, a 2 by 2 or 3 by 3 matrix, rather than, in fact, 3 by 3. All right, so... I'll make sure I'm on the right equation here. All right, so now what we do is we expand this to lowest order, and that to lowest order, remember, we have something like 1 over 1 minus epsilon, that's approximately 1 plus epsilon. And so doing that same thing to this tells us that the state L is an L0 plus lambda, the sum K0 not equal to L0, K0, E0L minus EK0, K0, E prime B minus delta 1 sub L0. Okay, so... All right, so let's... A lot of things simplify now, and, in fact, much of the complexity of this just goes away, because many of the terms that appear here are actually zero. So just to see how that works, let's first of all look at delta 1L. Now, you might think this should be zero, because, after all, we found delta 1 sub L, namely, it's the eigenvalues of the truncated potential. So this one is a suspicious character. And, in fact, the formula over here for K0 gives L0 here, so this is just the mean value of this V prime D in the state L0, but that's L0 V minus PDV PD L0, because V prime D is just the truncated... is just the potential minus the truncated potential. On the other hand, PD L0, of course, is L0, because PD is the projection operator on the space D, and so this... so we can drop these PD, and this thing is just L0 V minus V L0, which is just zero. So this term here is equal to zero. Okay, 
that's the first simplification. The next simplification is what happens when these states K are in D, but not equal to L. In other words, for K0 in the space D, the subspace D, but not the state L0, which is explicitly avoided. And so maybe I should rewrite our formula now. Now it's L0 plus lambda sum K0 not equal to L0. And now we have K0, K0, and we have D prime D L0 over P0 L minus K0. So the formula is simpler now. Okay, so it turns out that if K is in the space D, K0 is in the space D, then those states don't contribute either. And to see that, it's an argument very much like the one I just gave. You guys can see if I'm right here or not. We have here K0, D prime D L0, and suppose that K0 is in the space D. Well, this is K0, V minus PD, V, PD, L0. But since both K0 and L0 are in the space that are in the space D, the projection operator on D has no effect on K0 or L0. In other words, PD, K0 is K0, and of course P, L0 is L0. So this is the matrix element K0 of V minus V, L0, and that's obviously 0. So this thing has further simplified, and in fact, that's our, well, it's not the final simplification, but it's yet another simplification. It now allows us to write the state L as L0 plus lambda sum. I'm going to write this just K0 not in D. Obviously, it's a slight abuse of notation. Okay, so that's our formula now. Now there's one more simplification. Namely, that if the state, now the state's K0 are not in D, so PD on K0 is just 0. Because PD is a projection operator on the states in D. And consequently then, this matrix element K0, P prime D, L0, is K0, V minus PD, V, PD, L0. And we see that when K0 hits PD, it hits 0, so this is just K0, V, L0. So that term, that simplifies. And that means then that our formula is a lot simpler. It's simply L0 plus lambda sum K0 not in D. K0, K0, V, L0 over EL0 minus EK0. Notice that we've got another bonus from all these simplifications. Once K0 is not in D, these states, these energies, EK0, are just the eigenstates of K0 in the ordinary Hamiltonian, the ordinary simple Hamiltonian. For, since K0 is not in D. So, that's our formula, our final formula then for the energy eigenstate. 
And um, so what is so now we can now that we have the state L superscript one, we can use it to find delta two L. And um, so what is our formula? It's delta two sub L is L zero V prime D L one. And so that just taking the inner product here uh, of that, what we'll have then is um, we, our L1 is uh, it's this piece here without the lambda. And uh, so what we're getting then is some to write this really K0 not in D. It's an L0 B prime D K0 K0 B L0 over EL0 minus K0. Remember, EL0 does have uh, where did I write that down? EL0 has ED E0 Oh, that is that. I wrote it upside down. This is this is E D zero. So maybe, maybe you should do that. Alright, so that's E D zero. Um, okay, now there are a few more simplifications, namely that we saw Let's just consider L, so this matrix element, L0, B prime D, K0. This is V minus P, D, V, P, D, K0. But P, D on K0, since K0 is not in the uh, subspace, is just 0. And so this is just L0, B, K0. So that tells us then that this... Um, energy correction is the sum K0 not in D uh, absolute value of K0 V L0 absolute value squared divided by E0 L minus E0 K so this is the second order correction to the energy delta 2 and then what you do is um, you have then the energies uh, EL equals EL0 plus minus square delta 2 sub L. And so all together that is ED0 plus lambda delta 1 sub DL plus lambda square delta 2 sub L, where delta 2 sub L is given by this sum here. And um, delta 1 L is given by PDD PD L0 is delta 1 DL L0. So these, these, these are the eigenvalues values in the subspace. Okay, and just for completeness, um, what is L? Well, L is, uh, we have the formula here, L is L0 plus this. So this is the uh, state to order uh, lambda. So that's that, that's as far as I'm going with this, but you can go further. Um, again, in the case where um, this trick allows, in other words, where the truncated potential is non-degenerate, then you have non-degenerate perturbation theories, what you've got effectively by this, uh, by redefining the um, Hamiltonian as H0D, which is um, H0 plus lambda the truncated potential, and then adding lambda plus VD prime, where VD prime is V minus VD. This is giving you then a, a problem in, it's translated the generate state perturbation theory into non-degenerate perturbation theory. I've taken it to second order of the energy and first order of the states, 
You can go to Infinite Order in Lambda, and in many cases you'll get, in most cases you'll either get an asymptotic series or a convergent series. So that's the end of the great questions. By the way, because I was at a meeting, at the meeting they had various companies, representatives of various companies who want to sell products, and so they lay out candy or pens or other trinkets to attract people. So I helped myself to candy, so I can give you guys candy for asking questions, and I now have a pocket full of chocolate. This is better than the usual chocolate. So this is, it behooves you, if you like, sweets to answer, to ask questions. I talked, by the way, with the colloquium speaker, and I said that I had problems getting the students, the graduate students, to ask questions, and he said he found the same thing in Minnesota, and he said it's gotten worse in recent years. And I said, do you know why? And he said, no. I said, I don't know. Anyway, there's something wrong with our educational system. The students don't ask questions. I don't know what else. If you guys have any ideas, do you know why they don't ask questions? A couple of you, I think, know all the answers, so that's why you're not asking questions. But this is a small class. I don't have many to ask the question. We have the same effect in 466, 511, and 521. All right, so now I'm going to just do an application of just ordinary non-degenerate perturbation theory to some cases that are of interest, especially for chemistry. So let's just look at fine structure and the spin-over effect. And I'm going to do this in alkali atoms. And these alkali atoms have a nucleus of charge Z, or if you want, in standard units, I guess, ZQ. And then what you have is you have these various, you have a complete, you essentially have a noble gas atom, and then outside this one electron. And in the ground state, it's just in an S state, and the spin can be up or down. And so the potential that it sees, it's not a Coulomb potential, but so it's some, well, we can call it a Coulomb potential in a sense. We can say it's E times some phi of R, where here E is less than zero. But it's not just minus ZQ squared over 4 pi epsilon zero R, which would be minus ZE squared over R. It's more complicated than that because of the screening. But it's still spherically symmetric, so it's a function of R, so angular momentum is conserved. But all of the, but that hidden symmetry that made E and L just equal to E of N for hydrogen, actually a non-orthovistic hydrogen, that degeneracy is broken. So now L changes, change L, you change the energy. And the reason for that is that if this is in an S state, then it goes inside the cloud and it feels the attraction of the nucleus. If it's in a P state, it also goes in the cloud, but the probability of it being at the nucleus is, well, at the 
center is zero. The probability of it being in the nucleus, I guess, is finite, but it's very small. Um, and uh, so, in other words, psi nl squared at zero is, well, at r for small r, is proportional to um, r squared uh, times, no, it's r to the, I'm sorry, it's r to the l, r to the 2l at small r. And so, wait a minute, that's not going to It's, I want it to be constant when l is equal to zero. Yeah, maybe that is right. Okay, something like r to the 2l. Um, I, I didn't have that in my notes, so I'm just trying to remember. The point is that if it's in a, uh, an L equals 1, 2, or 3 state, then it, it, uh, it's an, it has an orbit that looks something like this, and it, it doesn't see the nucleus so much, so the energy is higher. So the point is that now we no longer have this. Instead, what we have is the ENL is greater than E N L prime if L is greater than L prime. And that's simply because the higher the orbital angular momentum, the uh, more the the more screening of the nucleus. Uh, and uh, that screening of the nucleus then um, raises the energy. So that's why, that's basically how these alkali elements differ from, um, from hydrogen. Now, um, if we're looking at sodium, the chemical symbol Na, does anybody know German what Na stands for? Not true. Anybody know? Anyway, something like that. Um, so it has a 1s state. Then it has a 2s state, then it has a 2p state, and so you can have two electrons here because of spin. You can have two electrons there. You can have six electrons here, so that's 10. And the 11th electron is in the 3s state. So this sodium has uh, 11 protons. And um, obviously 11 electrons. And these ones here form effectively a rare gas atom. And um, in fact, uh, what is that gas? It's helium has two yeah. protons. The next rare gas? Neon. Is it neon? Argon, I guess, is too heavy. So no, I think neon is too heavy. All right, well, it's not really relevant what the name is. I'm not very good with the name. It might be the other thing. Okay. Um, so, what, so, so this splitting here, it depends, of course, on which, on which, whether we're talking about sodium, there's also potassium, and um, let me see if I actually wrote this down. Uh, uh, yeah, here we go. Uh, rubidium, cesium, whoops, CS, <coughs> cesium, and uh, troncium, I think. And uh, so Na. And of course, the first one is hydrogen itself. These things get uh, except, uh, more reactive as you go higher um, uh, Z. Sodium, for example, if you put sodium in water, it will fizz and uh, liberate. It'll, it'll um, fizz and liberate the hydrogen. And if you have enough sodium, the hydrogen will explode um, as it reacts to the atmosphere. Potassium, if you toss it in water, uh, burn on the surface of the water. Cesium can toss on water, explodes when it hits the surface of water, and you get a violent flash. I've never tried these. Before. 
okay, this splitting will vary, this NL greater than NL prime. Let me estimate it as being of the order of an electron volt or less than an electron volt, but probably more than tenth of an electron volt. In other words, it's that region. There is a spin-orbit effect that I'm about to talk about is much smaller. It's of the order of 10 to the minus 3 electron volts. All right, so let's work this out. The SI unit is minus 1 over Q gradient of the Coulomb field. So we don't know quite what that is, but that's the electric field. And the visual electron in relativity sees a B field, which is minus B over C squared crossing the E. So I'm working with SI units. The magnetic moment of the electron here is Q, the spin operator, divided by the mass of the electron. And so you'd think you'd get the right answer if you just did mu dot B, but in fact, or minus mu dot B, in fact, there's a factor of 2 that's explained either by the Dirac equation or by some complicated arguments by Thomas. There's a factor of 2 that comes in. So the actual spin-orbit interaction is minus a half mu dot B. And so that is mu over 2 dot B over C squared cross E. And so all together then, so how much of the perturbation of HL dot S then is QS over 2M dot. And now what is B? B is P over M. And then there's 1 over C squared cross into, well, it's going to be R, the unit vector, and then 1 over minus Q, P, B, C, T, R. Okay, so we know that the gradient is pointing in the radial direction, in other words, is what that says. And now you can see that minus sign turns this into R cross P, which is L. L dot S is what we promised, L dot S. The Qs cancel, so we just have 1 over 2 M squared C squared, 1 over R, P, B, C, T, R, and then L dot S. S, just to remind you, is here in R over 2 sigma. All right, now L dot S is a trick for finding L dot S. Namely, J is L cross S, so J squared is going to be L squared plus S squared plus 2 L dot S. And consequently, L dot S is equal to a half J squared minus L squared minus S squared. So that's our formula. So in other words, to compute the spin orbit splittings, what you want to use is you want to use eigenstates of L and J, and you get to free the eigenstates of S. So this is the problem then in adding angular momentum. 
And so instead of having simply A, E sub N, L, S, we're going to go to E sub N, L, J, and S. And so these are going to be eigenstates of K squared, L squared, S squared, and J, C, or J3. So in these states, the mean value then, N, L, S, and if I use this notation, J, M, this having this being M, this being the J prime number, H, L, S, this is supposed to be N, so it's simply the mean value. So what we're doing here is first order perturbation theory. And so what is this mean value? What we get is 1 over 2 N squared, C squared, and it's simply these two things. In other words, N, L, S, J, M, 1 over R, T, C, D, R, L dot S, N, L, S, J, M. Okay, so that's our formula. Now, what we have is, since we have eigenstates of this, this is just, we know exactly what the L dot S is. Namely, this is going to be 1 over 2 M squared, C squared, well, it's going to be H bar squared. And I have a 1 half. Oh, that comes from this 1 half. So we have 1 half, and let me use a square bracket here. J, J plus 1 minus, so that's the eigenvalue of J squared, L, L plus 1 minus, and this is 1 half, 1 half plus 1, which is 3 halves. So this is our expression here. And then what we have is this matrix element, and effectively simply N, L, 1 over R, T, D, C, D, R, and L. And so this is, this depends on what the hydrogenic wave function is. And so altogether, this is H bar squared over 4 M squared, C squared, J, J plus 1 minus L, L plus 1 minus 3 quarters. And this would be an integral 0 to infinity, R sub N, L squared of R, 1 over R, T, P, C, D, R, R squared, D, R, because as you remember, Y, L, M is normalized to unity when you integrate over the omega. So we know exactly what this is. For this part, obviously we're not going to compute it exactly, but we need to get the sign right, and we need to, we need to estimate it. So let's, well, let's see. First of all, first of all, let's figure out what this is. First of all, what is J? So in class, what is J? If L is fixed and we have S, and S is from an electron, what are the possible values of J? I'll turn around this way. Let somebody say it. I didn't hear it, but I'll assume that you said this. J is L plus or minus a half. And so now we just substitute into this expression. If J is equal to L plus a half, then this square bracket is equal to L plus a half, L minus a half, minus L, L plus one, minus three quarters. 
And you can compute that. Exactly, it's L. All right. If, on the other hand, J is equal to L minus one half, then this bracket is equal to L minus one half, L plus one half, minus L, L plus one minus two fourths. And that is equal to minus L plus one. And so, so, what we have then is that in L as JM, HLS, NLS, JM is equal to A plus B over 4, M squared, C squared, the mean value of 1 over R, and you see the R in this case in L, and then either L or minus L minus 1 if J, oops, if J is equal to L plus one half, and if J is equal to L minus one half. Okay, this is called the Bondé interval rule. I'm guessing that if it's pronounced L on D, then the accent is the right accent. I don't really know how it's spelled on D. All right, so let's figure out what this thing is, this mean value. It's 1 over R, the derivative of this thing, and so we can say, I mean, VC is certainly, as I said to you in the beginning of this conversation, VC is not simply a Coulomb potential. But if it were a Coulomb potential, then it would be, so let me just write it like this, it would be, VC would be minus ZQ squared over 4 pi epsilon 0 R, or minus ZE squared over R. So it's not that, but that would be roughly what the, I'm just trying to get the order of magnitude of the sum. So DVC, DR then, is this minus 1, that to the minus 2, so this is Z, and let me not write an equal sign, just our famous twiddle. So it's ZE squared over R. The point is this is positive. And so when we form then 1 over R, mean value of DVC, DR, what we're getting is ZE squared, mean value R to the minus 3 in this state. And, well, what can that be? Well, just, and again, I keep writing these equal signs. I'm just trying to get the sign and the order of magnitude. We expect that to be ZE squared over the Bohr radius cubed. Now that's, this is just at best an order of magnitude. So, all right, so that's that. Now, let me just say, or repeat, that these splittings are just ones that, they're going to be much smaller than the splitting due to the screening. In other words, the split over here might be an electron volt or a tenth of an electron volt. These splittings are much smaller, and I'll estimate them in a moment. And so, for example, what we've got here is one level that is 3T, 3 halves, and then a 
3P one half, and these states can decay down to a 3S, which is the ground state of sodium. And, in fact, the splitting here is even smaller than that. What I should say is something like that. So this is this one, and this is this one. So the splitting that's due to screening that pulls the L equals 1 state above the L equals 0, as I said, is maybe an electron volt or a tangent electron volt. The splitting here we'll find out is around 10 to the minus 3 electron volts. And, in fact, these two lines, that is to say this line from that transition and maybe this line from this transition, these are called the sodium D lines. And they're of the order of 5,900 angstroms, which I guess is, is that yellow light? Somebody here maybe is doing optics. Sodium is yellow. That's right. I remember even if you put sodium in a fire, maybe it's yellow. Okay. So these are the sodium D lines. And, in fact, the higher one here is 5,890 angstroms, and this one is 5,896 angstroms. And you can compute those energies. The exact value of the splitting, and then we can estimate it and see that our estimate is plausible. Okay. So let me see. So I've got this pocket full of chocolate, and there are no questions. It's going to melt. It's going to melt. So let's have a question. So I'm thinking of doing identical particles as the next topic. Is that okay with everybody? The reason I want to do it that way is that we do identical particles. Then we can do scattering theory, and then we can do scattering of identical particles. Otherwise, we could do scattering theory, identical particles, and then scattering of identical particles. I suppose it's better to do identical particles first. All right. Anyway, this E3P3 has minus E3S1 has. This, to compute it, this would be plus HU, which is HC over lambda, or 2 pi H bar C over lambda. And for some reason, I used a particle physics wallet card. So H bar C is 197.326, and I'll just go with 9. Actually, I've got all these figures, but that's kind of ridiculous. MEV Fermi, and then there's a 2 pi, and then the lambda here is 5890, and it's angstrom, so that's 10 to the fifth Fermi. So the Fermis cancel, and what we finally come out with is, I'll just skip the arithmetic, 210499, I'll let it go as 5. That's kind of silly. And then on the other hand, E3P1 half minus E3S1 half turns out to be 2.10285, 
uh, tree. Mm -hmm. And so the splitting, the uh, I'll just call it delta LS in this case, turns out to be 2.142 times 10 to the minus 3 in V. In other words, it's this minus that. And you can see the two one O's cancel into uh, this is basically 5 minus 2.85. And that gives you this number. Um, so it's 2 milli electron volts. And let's, let's estimate it then. Uh, Delta E uh, LS here we saw was what was the Z E squared over A zero cubed, and then there's an H bar squared over four M squared C squared, and then there's an L or an L. Well, the splitting is L minus minus L plus one, so that's two L plus one. So altogether, the splitting is. Um, 2 L plus 1 over um, 4 M squared C squared, and then there's an H bar squared, and then E squared over A0 cubed. So let me just see. And there's actually, I put in a Z E squared. There's a question as to whether there should be a Z there or not. So I'll put in a Z, but um, it's because of screening, the whole Z is, is not legitimate. Um, a, a0, here I've used A0 as H bar squared over, well, I guess I haven't used it yet, but A, A0 is H bar squared over ME squared, so this gives us delta E L S is approximately 2L plus 1. Sorry. Um, yeah, let, let me pull you back in a half hour. Um, so it's 2L plus 1. Um, e squared over A0 cubed, H bar over 2MC squared, and now we can write that as E squared over H bar to the 6, M cubed, E to the 6, H bar squared over 4, M squared, C squared, 2L plus 1, and so that's roughly a quarter, E to the 8, M H bar to the 4, C squared, 2L plus 1. And finally, uh, 1 quarter, M C squared, E squared over H bar C to the 4, 2L plus 1. Okay, now we can identify some of this. This is a half 2L plus 1. Well, let me just call that L plus a half. So that's L plus a half. Well, I lost the Z, so let's, let's keep the Z. But we should call it Z prime because we don't really know whether it should really be Z prime. But it's not necessarily Z. It's only Z prime. And uh, one half MC squared... That is the uh, one half MC, MC squared alpha squared. You see, A, E squared over H bar C across is alpha, which is 1 over 137, roughly, the final structure constant. Um, one half MC squared alpha squared is the energy, the ground state binding energy of atomic hydrogen. Um, and what's left over then is a factor of alpha squared, and then part z prime. So this is smaller. So in other words, what we have here is the delta E L S is approximately 13.6 eV, 
times L plus a half times whatever the effective Z is, and then times alpha squared. And alpha squared is 1 over 137 squared. So let's see. For this particular case, L is equal to 1. So this is 3 halves. 3 halves times that is roughly 20 EV. Z prime, and now we have 1 over 137 squared. Well, that's less than 10 to the minus 4. And I can absorb the extra difference between 1 over 100 squared and 1 over 137 squared by adding another prime to Z, since we don't know what Z is. So altogether, this is 2 times 10 to the minus 3 EV times whatever Z double prime is. So that's actually not a bad estimate, as long as we have Z double prime equal to 1. Z in this particular case was 11. Z prime might be 5. And Z double prime might be 2 or 3. So this isn't giving, by any means, an exact answer. But it certainly gives us an order of magnitude. And altogether, we might be able to argue that this is 3 times. So it's off by a factor. The estimate's off by a factor of 50%. But that's a very good estimate. All right. Are there any questions? Because we've got, I've finished my notes. And we've got 9 minutes. So I've got this pocket full of notes from Shawmut. So we really need some questions. Okay. I've got one. But it kind of doesn't relate to this. What? I have a question, but it doesn't really relate specifically to the degeneration, but like for the sodium. Yeah. Now, if you take like a sodium mineral. Right. So I'm not going to. Now I can't. Okay. So if I have a sodium. Why don't you turn the camera a little bit. All right. Okay. Great. And I add my first electron, right? It'll go into the 1S state. Right. Or it'll go to a higher state and then decay down, right? Right. So it'll fill up the 1Ss. And then I'll get two electrons. Two electrons. Yep. So then I add four electrons and I'm up to the 2S. Right. Okay. Now when I add the fifth electron, I'll fill one of those peaks, right? Right. Now when I add the next electron, do I fill one of the P's that are spin up? Or do I pair the one that I just filled and that spin down? I don't know is a true answer that I can give to your question. But maybe we can think about it. So what you're doing is you've got this. You've got two electrons in the 2P shell. And the question is, do you give them the same value of M or not? Right. And just guessing, I would say don't give them the same value of M because that would allow them to be away from each other. And you get less economic repulsion. In fact, I can even do a little better than that because remember that you can make states that are, first of all, the state M equals 0, psi 0 goes as cosine theta. The wave function goes as cosine theta. 
and that's proportional, that's seen in the law. But you can take combinations. The other states are psi plus or minus 1 are something like sine theta e to the plus or minus i c. And you can take linear combinations of them to be size of x, which is sine theta cosine c, and psi y, which is sine theta sine c. And so these guys would basically, a z state would look sort of like, would look like that. The x state would look sort of like this. And the y state would look sort of like that. So if I were designing the world, I'd put one of them into the z and one of them into the x state. X state being a linear combination. These guys, this is psi plus plus sine, psi plus 1 plus sine minus 1, and this is psi plus 1 minus sine minus 1. So I would do that rather than pair the electrons, because the spin-spin interaction is very small. Your question also brings up this business of identical particles. Do you have more questions about that? I've got more chocolate. Not specifically that one. Huh? Not specifically that one, but I do have some other questions that are completely not related. All right, go for it. I was reading about helium-3 and helium-4. One of them is bosonic and one of them is electronic. And I don't really understand why that happens. And like how you can, I mean, if you have like a helium atom, I mean, do you have to be in a certain range for that, for the Pauli exclusion principle to decide whether it's electronic or bosonic? Electronic? Or, no. Well, let's see. Whether it's bosonic or fermion. Right, right. Right. Well, what's going on there for us? Well, let's see. Dang, that was just part of the talk. Let me go to the part of the talk. Let's turn the camera on. All right. Well, as you probably know, in fact, I'm certain that you know, that the deal with helium-3 is that it's a neutron and two protons and then two electrons. And so you have five fermions. And so you're going to get, when you put five fermions together, just adding angular momentum, you're going to get something that's one-halves, three-halves, five-halves, or something. That's going to be the total angular momentum. That makes it a fermion. The case for helium, helium is sort of an archetypical helium-4, is, of course, N, N, P, P, and then electron, electron. So that's six fermions. That makes a boson. All right. Now you're asking something subtle about the range of these, about the range in which these things are bosons and fermions. And in other words, are there certain energies, are there certain, say, scattering processes, or equivalently, could you increase the pressure to such an extent that these things would be so close together that maybe you'd have something different happening? And in other words, that they wouldn't. And I think the one that we might try to do a pressure experiment on would be helium-4. Because as it starts out, it's a boson, and it wants to clump together. So you can have, if you can get it down, if you can get it down to its ground state, it would be even a Bose-Einstein condensate. So is that 
the individual parts all being in their ground state? Or the idea is that if you have, say, a million helium-4 atoms, and you lower the temperature, they're all going to go into whatever the ground state of potential is. You have them in some potential well, say, and you lower the temperature, they'll all go into the same ground state. But now you can imagine, well, what would happen if that potential well were really almost a delta function? In other words, if it was really, really, really spiked, and you lowered the temperature. Well, at some point, the system would discover that it's six fermions, I think. And so at some point, I mean, you can still lower the temperature, and if the potential is still not really a spike, you still get a Bose-Einstein number. If you've got it really, really small, and where is that distance? I don't know. It's something like 10 to the negative 20 electrons. Okay, so it's not really a spike. Well, it's not really a spike. It's not really a spike. It's not really a spike. It's probably smaller than 10 to the minus 20. Physically, this is a really absurd case, because you're trying to squeeze 1,000 helium atoms into a space smaller than the space of one helium nucleus. If you did that, and also lowered the temperature, I think you'd find that you didn't have any longer a Bose-Einstein condensate if your spike potential was smaller than this distance of one fermion, which is the characteristic size of the nucleus. So in other words, you couldn't pack these nuclei together as bosonic nuclei. And it seems to me, if you were below that distance. But of course, all kinds of other things would be happening there, because when you got them anywhere near that distance, you'd have strong, you'd have the nuclear forces between these helium nuclei would be considerable, and well, I don't know. Actually, the helium nucleus, I think, is a pit of this potential. In other words, there's a great deal of binding energy in the helium nuclus. And so you put a lot of helium nuclei together, I don't think they're going to jump and form carbon or something. Anyway, so yeah, I think there is a limit to this. But, all right, I've said enough. It's speculation. Turn the damn thing off. Thank you.